take a breath with me. Okay, so everybody breathe in and then breathe out. For every single one of us on this planet, all 8 billion of us, we do that 22,000 times a day. It's kind of easy, isn't it? Because like air is just here. It's just you go, it's just there. We have this bubble of air around us all the time in our atmosphere. And I think about like, where was this air a few hours ago? Maybe it was outside. Maybe it was blowing through a tree, you know? Maybe it was underneath the wings of a bird or a butterfly. Or maybe it flew through an insect. And now I've just put it in my mouth. I love it. And when we see the Earth from a distance, you can actually see that big bubble of air surrounding our planet. It's like a thin, thin, thin bubble, but it's there. And it looks fragile, but it's not because it protects us from so many things. It protects us from radiation from our sun and from the cosmos. It also prevents any debris or any meteors to come into our atmosphere. Our atmosphere pushes them out. And that's what makes it so difficult for astronauts to re-enter Earth because of our amazing atmosphere. And it's just here, right there, all the time around me. I love it. I love information. I love it. I love trying to find the unusual in the things we take for granted. And I love trying to break down the extraordinary into something that feels relatable. And that's my job. I'm really lucky. I get to do what I love. But it, it didn't just happen, you know. I want to tell you my story, if that's okay. So it began in August 2011, when I was making my first theatre show, combining science and art, because I was unsure what I wanted to do with my life. I had two degrees in engineering in, in biosystems and a PhD in a similar related field. And I had shifted across into the arts as a writer and a performer. And that was starting to feel like that was coming to a close too, because something felt missing. And I started looking at particle physics to see if I can figure out what that was, as you do with particle physics. And I looked at different decisions, different moments in my life where I'd made decisions. And this is what my theater show was about. And I made movies about these moments as if they still existed, as if these lives still existed. So for instance, the, the person that decided to stay on in full-time research, I made a movie about that. I made a movie about the girl, as a graduate engineer, stayed on in the London underground working on the tube. About the girl who wanted to be a ballerina. About the girl who wanted to go to space. And for the girl who wanted to go to space, astronaut Neve. I borrowed a flight suit from the European Space Agency, ESA, and I rolled up a load of science fiction movies and I pressed record. Yeah, it was cool. Having great fun. But an interesting thing happened the more we continued to do that. I started to perceive some sort of shift inside me and I actually became quite sad. I feel more sad. It feels very real that I'm not an astronaut. Yeah. What do you do with impossible dreams? Hmm? When do you let them go? Have you let yours go? Because I knew in that moment that I hadn't let mine go. I have wanted to be a part of space since I was eight. I've always known. I knew it at eight. I knew it at 18. I knew it at 28. I knew it at 38. And yet I'd done nothing about that. Why was that? I hadn't even taken an astronomy course. I'd, you know, had all these achievements, you know, my degrees and all these different accolades, but the one thing I wanted to do, I didn't do anything about it. And I think, in a nutshell, the reason for that was, was I don't think there were any female role models in Ireland at a time when I needed them to help me see that someone like me could actually live the life that I really wanted. 
I also think that I was afraid to fail because it's easy to have dreams, isn't it, when you don't actually touch them. But what if I stepped forward into actually achieving my dream and I failed? Then what would I possibly be? I don't know. I'm just going to take a drink of water. Water. You know, we're composed of 60% water. And while we can survive for two months without water, we can only survive for three days without this stuff. And for many of us, you know, lucky to live in a first world or a second world country, water is quite available to us, isn't it? You know, you turn on the tap, you have a shower, you wash your clothes, it's just there. And when you see the earth from space, the biggest thing you see is the volume of water because 71% of the Earth's surface is covered in water and 96% of that is in the oceans. So when you see the Earth from space, you see this reflection of the sun bouncing off this blue and then contrasted by the clouds that swirl around our planet. And they say it's like a blue marble or a pale blue dot. Beautiful. Anyway, back to where I was my moment of clarity. So I had done nothing about it because I was afraid to fail. And I also had told this story to myself that someone like me doesn't get to have a life like that. And so I started looking at that and really trying to figure out why I felt that. And maybe it was about passion. So if we look at a, a survey in the Europe and the United States, when they asked people about were they happy with their job, 65% of them said yes, they were. But only 20% of them had actually said that they were passionate about what they wanted to do. So that means 80% of us aren't passionate about what we like. And I think I was one of the 80%. And so I looked back on all of my decisions and I thought about that and I thought about what was it in all of those decisions that kind of drew me to it in the first place by being an engineer, or being a scientist, being an actor, being a writer? And I realized with that, and also looking through my diaries, I kept diaries as a kid, I have loads of them. I had all this information, and the one common thread in all of it were that there was something in my values. I stood for something in all of the things that I did, but I hadn't found a way to bring it all together. So from looking at all that, I realize now my values are equity, education for all, curiosity, that's huge for me, connection, connecting with people, and sustainability. And I also realized that the parts of my life that I really love the most is when I was talking, when I was communicating, which is what I'm doing now. And so bringing that all together, that's why space resonated so much with me. It made me so excited because I think it had everything that I wanted. All my passions were pulled together in one go. And so, in 2011, I sat there for two years trying to work, figure it out, and finally in 2013, I, I just started. I just began. I had no plan, but I knew that if I didn't try, I'd never know. And so now, I have a very different life. Uh, what I do now is I get to report about space and science, uh, you know, all sorts of launches and activities. Um, I also... Um, uh, write for the Irish Times. I'm a space features writer for our national paper, the Irish Times, as well as BBC Sky at Night magazine. I have a visa, a media visa for the United States that allows me to go in and go out. I was given um, an ESA Champion Award, which is awarded by the European Space Agency, which means I promote education in a way that they like. And I've also been on my own adventures. I report on TV and radio and I've made children's programs, but I have my own space adventures, which uh, allow me to communicate the human side of space and science. So, for instance, I've done this. I've been on a zero gravity flight in Moscow, also known as the Vomit Comet, for obvious reasons. 
and no, I didn't vomit. Oh, yeah, lots of everyone else did, but, but I didn't. Um, I have been to many launches at uh, NASA um, and the Baikonur Cosmodrome um, to see crew launch to the International Space Station. And most recently, we're on the cusp of the wave of the next generation of human space exploration to the moon and the Artemis mission, so I've been covering that. So I feel, I feel very lucky that I get to do all of that. And mostly, the thing I love more than anything else is, is events like this. Um, I also get to create events for the general public. I go into schools, I talk to children, I talk to families, I talk to communities of people who feel that science and space isn't for them. When I explain my stories, we try to figure out what they're most curious about and we help them move forward in their quest for whatever it is that their passions are. And one of the space ventures that stands out for me more than any other was the time that I spent in the high Utah desert, living in one of the eight habitats around the world that simulates, simulates life as if you're on Mars and allows you to conduct research. And that's called, the one here is the Mars Desert Research Station. And I got to spend just 15 days with these amazing people, three scientists and um, an engineer from across the world. And for those 15 days, we lived as if we were on Mars. My job was crew journalist or communicator, and I had to capture the whole experience from beginning to end. And I was determined to capture it in a very human way. So let's take another breath together again. So everybody breathe in and breathe out. So we can do that really easily here because we've got this bubble of air around us. But of course, on Mars, the atmosphere is very different. It's a cold, thin atmosphere of carbon dioxide. There's nothing on Mars. There's no water. There's no red circle. There's no TEDx. There's nothing. So when we were on Mars, on the Mar at the Mars Desert Research Station, we simulated that life by every time we went outside, we wore spacesuits, and we also brought in our own ration of food and water. And what was really interesting was, in a matter of days at the Mars Desert Research Station, I completely forgot my life back on Earth. I got to learn a whole new appreciation for this stuff, I'll tell you. I learned that I could only flush the toilet for number twos, poo-poos, and not number ones, wee-wees. Um, I learned to live off freeze-dried, salty food, and I was chronically dehydrated the whole time. There was this motor that had this honking noise every time you went to use it. So it would go, unk, unk, unk. So every time you flushed the toilet, it was 20, unk, unk, unk. When I would go to fill a glass of water or the kettle, it would be three to five, unk, unk, unk. I learned to brush my teeth with one, unk, you know. I learned to live with just two pairs of trousers and four tops. I learned to live in a tin can with four people and got around all the tensions. I got used to living without civilization, hundreds of kilometers away from it, with just my three scientists and one engineer. And I realized that if anything were to go wrong, nobody was going to come anytime soon. And when I came back to Earth and I walked into my apartment, I saw everything completely differently. I saw my wardrobe of clothes, I saw my pile of towels and linen and books and cushions and that I had way too much space for one person. And it made me realize that we could live on Earth in a completely different way if we learned to really value our resources differently. And we, we built homes that were naturally recyclable, naturally sustainable. And I said about sharing my story with the public, and I found that the more human it was, the better it was received, and the more we get into the science, talking about the honking motor, and the fact that the toilet didn't flush for five days, and the fact that I didn't shower for two weeks. These were the delicious pieces that people really liked. And something, another perspective that I really want to share with you that happened in all of this was about how I see, saw myself in the overall picture of my place in space. So, for instance, right now I'm standing on this infamous red circle and we're all at this TEDx event and we're in this room where we have these four walls around us. And we can choose to see our lives as this moment right now, right? That's fair enough. But we know we're in a building, we know what the, we're at the American University of Bulgaria in Blagosgrad. And uh, if we see that, we can see ourselves on this map here, in Blagosgrad. There we are. 
And we know that we're in Bulgaria and we know that Bulgaria is in Europe. So right now, when we look at that map, we look at Bulgaria and we look at ourselves and we look at ourselves here in the TEDx event. And if we zoom out more, we're on Earth, but we don't tend to see ourselves really on Earth, do we? We kind of stop when we get to sort of Bulgaria level, but we are. And not only that, we're in a system of planets that orbit our sun. And our sun is one planet in our solar interstellar neighborhood, the nearest of which is 4.3 light years away, where a light year is 10 trillion kilometers. It's just a measure of distance. And our star and our neighborhood of stars, they're grouped together in a galaxy, the Milky Way, 100,000 light years in diameter. We're in that picture, folks. And that galaxy is grouped into a group of galaxies known as the local galactic group. And our local galactic group is grouped into a cluster called the Virgo supercluster. And that's grouped into a local supercluster. And 55 of those make up the observable universe, the edge of which is 46.6 billion light years from us here right now in this room. So we can choose to see ourselves there and here at the same time. And when I saw that, when I really, really saw that, I went, why am I worrying so much? I'm alive for like a nanosecond. I can do anything with my life because I'm part of this bigger thing. And so what I want to do with my life is what I'm doing now, but really I want to go to space and I want to present a human perspective, my own experience of going to space. Because so far 622 people have been to space and almost all of them describe this shift in perception the first time they see Earth from a distance. They say that they see Earth as this tiny, fragile thing, breathing and moving and hanging in the void and protected by this paper-thin atmosphere that I talked about. And that from space, national boundaries disappear and that all the conflicts that we have, they become less clear from that perspective. And that the desire to create a planetary society with the united will to protect and preserve our pale blue dot, our blue marble, becomes both imperative and absolutely important. So, I have a passion for communication. I want to humanize space. I want to make the ordinary extraordinary and make the, make the extraordinary seem like every day. It's taken me a long time to get where I am today but I'm on my journey. So let's take one last breath together. Let's breathe in and breathe out. The earth gives you everything you could possibly want. Be one of the 20% who are passionate about your life and go ahead and live the very best version of it. I'm making my impossible possible one day at a time. Let me ask you one question. What perspective do you choose to see? Because you can change your lives in an instant. Thank you.